comprehensive, relevant, and insightful conversations about health and medicine happen here on MedStar Health Doc Talk. Today we are focusing on a relatively rare condition that affects one of the eight bones in the wrist called the lunate. That one little bone becomes necrotid, a nice way of saying that the bone loses blood supply and dies, and patients are usually young. Symptoms seem to develop from nowhere, and the result is debilitating pain, tenderness, swelling, and the loss of motion, known as Kienbox disease. Our guest today is a pioneer in the treatment of Kienbox, whose extraordinary approach to the condition has become a signature surgery here at MedStar Union Memorial Hospital. I'm so happy to introduce Dr. James Higgins, chief of the Curtis National Hand Center, the largest hand center in the nation, right here in Baltimore. Dr. Higgins, thank you for being with us today on MedStar Health Doc Talk. Thanks for having me, Deborah. I look forward to it. It's been over a century since Robert Kienbach first published about degenerative changes of the lunate bone. Let's talk about what that little bone is and why it's important to the anatomy. The lunate is a bone that uh, we would take for granted. You'd live your whole life uh, using your wrist for activities of sports or work without thinking about the inner workings of your wrist. There are several small bones within the wrist, one of which is called the lunate, which serves as the keystone of the wrist. This typically will cause no problem for anyone throughout the course of their life unless you suffer from Kienbox disease. In Kienbox disease, the lunate spontaneously loses its blood supply. This is a process called avascular necrosis. It's poorly understood why this occurs, but when it does, it can cause swelling, loss of range of motion, and pain. Patients typically present to the office confused about why their wrist spontaneously starts to cause them difficulty. The typical patient is usually very young and often male. The greatest incidence of this is among men that are between the ages of 17 and 40 years of life, and it typically affects their dominant hand. So that would suggest to me that it could be from overuse, or or is there ever trauma involved, or maybe they had an accident? Sure, there are a lot of uh, speculated etiologies of the problem. Among them is trauma, and in a small percentage of these patients, they will actually report an episode of trauma, whether it be a fall a sporting injury, or a work-related injury. But the vast majority of the patients will have no history of trauma and will demonstrate both clinical symptoms as well as x-ray findings that provide the diagnosis. But other patients will show no history of traumatic injury and will spontaneously demonstrate the symptoms and x-ray findings that give them the diagnosis of Kienbox disease. But before the x-ray, they're experiencing the swelling, they can't turn their wrist that much, it's, it's weaker from what I understand, and they probably think maybe they fractured it or it's broke. What brings them to you? Well, since often they will present without any history of trauma, they're usually not pursuing care for a very long time. So they may go about their sporting activities or work-related activities thinking that perhaps they have tendonitis or that they have swelling that's related to overuse. Uh, some people will mistakenly attribute their pain to common diagnosis such as uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. And then ultimately, when they come and see us, if their symptoms seem suspicious enough to warrant a workup for it, we'll obtain an x-ray and in some cases follow up with uh, an MRI. These are the studies that typically will lead to the diagnosis of Kienbox disease. Which is done how? How how is that diagnosis made? So if the x-ray demonstrates Kienbox disease, it will typically look as if the lunate bone has become denser. On an x-ray, that has the appearance of being whiter, literally more bright than the surrounding bones. Other things that we can sometimes see are fractures that will develop within the bone or loss of height of the bone. Literally, it starts to collapse. Uh, those are the hallmark signs on x-ray of a, uh, a vascular necrosis process in the lunate. What do you mean by collapse? It starts to crumble? Literally, it loses its integrity. So all of the carpal bones, which are small bones, perhaps the size of a marble in some cases or a peanut, these are small bones that uh, move in concert with one another, but throughout the course of use of your hand during a day, there is pressure exerted on each of these bones with grasping and with lifting objects. This pressure will cause the lunate, particularly when it's lost its blood supply and its structural integrity, to start to become flattened. It literally starts to shorten. It will fracture inside the bone and start to collapse as if it's almost akin to a dented ping pong ball. This is an analogy we'll often use for this. So the bone itself loses its height. When that happens, this 
avascular necrosis, the bone dies, does that, could that happen to other bones in the wrists? And if it happens on one side of your hand, is, is it likely to happen on the other wrist? It's very rare to have this in both wrists in the lunate, and it's extremely rare to have it in other bones in the wrist. So this is a curious thing in orthopedic uh, subspecialties. There are certain bones around the human skeleton that are prone to develop this spontaneous avascular necrosis. Within the upper extremity, this is by far the most common, and the others are even more rare. So uh, when we see a patient with Keenbox disease, we don't typically tell them that they should be on guard for finding avascular necrosis elsewhere. What is it when they come in and they talk or they make an appointment? Do they already have a diagnosis by the time they see you or do you make that diagnosis? Oftentimes they will, particularly if patients have been sent from around the country or out of state. Uh, they have obtained the diagnosis of Keenbox disease and they're coming to us because we do have unique and specialized surgical treatments that have been demonstrated to be extremely successful for this problem. But there are patients, particularly local patients, that will present to us because we're hand surgeons and they have hand uh, or wrist pain, and we will work them up and obtain the diagnosis of Keenbox for them. You mentioned patients coming here from out of state, and let's just put that into perspective. They come here, the Curtis National Hand Center is, as I mentioned, the largest hand center in the world. Tell us a little bit about the hand center so that we have some perspective on why so many people come here or why they're referred to the hand surgeons here. Sure. Well, the Curtis Hand Center is a very special place. And uh, in Baltimore, it's a very well-known institution because it has been a part of the landscape of of medical treatment here since uh, just shortly after World War II. So the Curtis National Hand Center is named after Ray Curtis, who was uh, one of its original founders. And the subspecialty of hand surgery itself really did not come into reality until the post-World War II period. Prior to that, there were no such things as hand surgeons. But In the World War II period, there were many soldiers coming back from the war who had experienced upper extremity problems, and there were some luminaries in the field of hand surgery at the time who decided it would be worthwhile to create a subspecialty of surgeons who practiced solely on treatment of upper extremity injuries. These specialists would be capable of treating a myriad of different problems, fractures of the hand, burns, nerve injuries, Uh, blood vessel injuries, tendon lacerations. So this would be a specialist for every potential uh, injury that could be encountered in the upper limb. That idea was spread throughout the country. And one of the originators and original hand surgeons in the United States was a graduate of MedStar Union Memorial Hospital's training program. Uh, His name was Raymond Curtis. He went into the U.S. Army and treated uh, wounded GIs in an Army Medical Center in California. Upon completing his work in the U.S. Army, he then returned to Baltimore and presented himself to Union Memorial Hospital and said he would like to start a hand center. At that time, that was previously never described, and so the administration said, I think that's a good idea, and he um, started to build an increasing group of interested both military and civilian surgeons that developed the subspecialty of surgery of the hand. That legacy has grown over the um, following decades in the city of Baltimore, and we now have uh, one of the largest hand centers in the world. Uh, we have 14 subspecialists who solely treat upper extremity injuries, and we have a large training program that or that trains um, surgeons in the subspecialty of hand surgery. In addition, we have a, an ongoing relationship with the U.S. military where we uh, train all of the U.S. Army hand surgeons here in our civilian hospital. So there's a very big legacy and tradition of hand surgery here in Baltimore that has grown in its reputation, not just regionally, but also nationally and internationally. So many of our surgeons are academically active and have developed and promoted very novel treatments for a number of different issues. And this is one of them. So our footprint in hand surgery is large. And uh, when people suffer from Keenbox disease, unfortunately, there are not many established successful procedures for the treatment of this problem. These patients are typically very young and active and in pursuit of their sporting interests or work interests, they need restoration of the function of their wrist. So those patients will often reach out to us from afar and they can come from other continents or other countries or other states. So we get a lot of um, 
a lot of contact from afar, and, and uh, typically in the beginning, we will perform a lot of those uh, visits as televisits for the convenience of the patient so that they can get a sense and talk to the surgeons and see whether or not the procedures that we have to offer are for them. And subsequently, if they decide that that's what they want to do, we make arrangements, and it's very common for us here. So we have the infrastructure to enable them to travel from afar and to visit Baltimore for their hand treatment. And then often we'll do the post-operative care in as convenient a manner as we can muster and use some of the local resources so that they're able to get the reconstruction for their risks that are afforded for every other young patient in region. Thank you for the history. Um, that's very insightful. And I think it's important because it, it definitely plays into where we are with the key inbox treatment because as is the history and tradition of the Curtis National Hand Center, which is based in education and learning and research, you went to Austria in 2010 to study a new approach with Dr. Heinsberger and became the only two surgeons in the whole world to do this particular procedure, which we're going to get to. But before we talk about that extraordinary procedure, let's talk first about what the standard of care is for key and box to bring us to where we are with that treatment and how you came to that So approach. the difficulty with developing a treatment plan for any disease process is certainly curtailed if the understanding of the etiology of the problem is, is poor. And that is the case with Kimbox disease. So why patients spontaneously develop loss of blood supply of this small bone in the wrist is a little bit of a mystery. We have over decades and decades of research on this topic come up with several theories, but none of them have been definitively shown to be the sole accurate theory. So it appears that there's a component of structural abnormalities in the wrist that put you at risk for this problem, particularly the relative length of adjacent bones, the radius and the ulna, which are the forearm bones. There is some credence to the theory that some of this may have been stimulated by previous trauma in some cases, so uh, traumatic uh, influences. There's also appears to be a genetic component that comes into play with the development of Keenbox disease. It would increase your risk of having Keenbox disease were you to have uh, relatives, whether first or second degree relatives, with a history of avascular necrosis as well. And then there are other risk factors, including certain medication usage that uh, come into play as well. But if designing, imagine if designing a surgery that would treat this problem, some of them are geared at changing the dynamics of the wrist in such a manner that the length of relative positions of other bones in the wrist are changed. So we will shorten surrounding bones so that pressure is relieved on the lunate. That's one tactic. Another maneuver would be to restore blood supply to the lunate that is crumbling by inserting blood vessels or bone with blood supply attached to it into the middle of these bones. And other procedures are aimed at attempting to incite an inflammatory response and create healing of the surrounding bone. They are all very speculative, and that is the way that they were originally designed and were tested. They have mixed reviews in terms of success. Most of them are applied to Keenbox in its earliest stages, meaning when the bone is not particularly collapsed, when the structural integrity of the bone is still preserved. The most vexing cases of Keenbox disease are those when the lunate is collapsed. So when the structural support of the bone has collapsed and the bone starts to fragment, and there are times when we see patients, and this is the very first glimpse we get of Keenbox disease. So you would think, boy, this has been going on a long time. I wonder what has this patient been doing uh, prior to this? And oftentimes a patient will be sort of putting up with it, thinking it's tendonitis, thinking it's a sprained wrist that's going to recover. And by the time we actually image it, we see that the lunate is collapsed. It is in that setting that we developed the procedure that we are currently offering for what's called advanced Keenbox disease. So where the bone is completely dead and what crumbling, and does that mean that there are bone fragments that are just floating around in the wrist causing pain? Typically when we use this procedure, it's a procedure where we have a lunate, which is in multiple pieces. It is now collapsed and the ability to restore that bone to its normal function is essentially impossible. The conventional treatment for that, when the bone is that far advanced, is to literally remove the bone. So what's considered the standard answer for that is to remove the lunate because it's considered irreparable. 
when you remove the central bone in the wrist like that, sort of a keystone bone, you would imagine you have to do something else to stabilize the rest of the wrist. And the other procedures, which are described as salvage procedures, would include removing surrounding additional bones, which are completely uninjured, in an effort to balance the wrist, or fusing other bones together in an effort to balance the wrist. Both of these cost this typically very young patient a great deal of loss of range of motion. In what way? They can't... Flex and extend their wrist. So it's typically in the plane uh, that one would be using when you're throwing a baseball, for example. So in the flexion extension arc of the wrist becomes uh, quite limited with removal of bones or partial fusions of bones. So that was the really the unsolved problem that presents itself to hand surgeons. And we have for decades been looking for a solution for this because it is a compelling, difficult problem in very young patients. And what was the feedback usually with these patients? Were they happy with the surgery or unhappy, would you say? Typically, these are procedures that do not have good uh, outcomes in terms of range of motion, grip strength, or subjective satisfaction. So we find that we're applying to young, healthy patients procedures that are typically reserved for older osteoarthritic patients, meaning these are operations that are typically done for osteoarthritis. So when you're young and you're healthy and you're playing sports and you're earning a wage and you're active perhaps in a very um, heavy labor job, the prospect of poor range of motion, poor grip strength and pain uh, in your wrist is um, not very appealing. How did the patients describe the pain? If someone was listening to this and they're thinking, oh, my wrist has been bothering me, I might have this, what would be the telltale sign for them? So a patient with Keenbox disease, they typically report that their pain is on the dorsum of the wrist, which is the word we use to describe the back of your hand or back of your wrist. And it's sort of central, meaning it's in this uh, site in the central aspect of the wrist that's more or less in line with the middle finger. Uh, that area right in the central aspect of the back, back of the wrist is typically what will intermittently become swollen, will become painful with power grip, and they'll find that they have a loss of arc of range of motion in that throwing motion. Mm-hmm. And is the pain all the time or just when they're moving their wrist and trying to lift things? No, it's typically with use only. More often than not, patients will say, when I'm not using my wrist, it's manageable. But it's upon lifting, and often these are very, you know, these are patients that are young and they're going to the gym, they're, they're working, trying to lift weights, and they notice when they're trying to do a push up or they're trying to bench press or uh, lifting objects that their wrist cannot bend as much as the opposite wrist and that it hurts when loading it. Well, that sounds like the exact way I would hold my hand just to type on the computer. Yes, although for sure, uh, loading of the wrist is the most symptomatic. So it's when pushing off a table, pushing off a bed, um, doing a push-up, trying to force uh, or push heavy objects. Um, this is typically the most uh, painful thing for them. Okay. So at what point did you then say, I got to find a new way for this? I have to come up with a new solution because this surgery is just not a great option that I'm offering to my patients who come into the Curtis Hand Center. Well, I would paint it as uh, good fortune. I think we, to a degree, backed our way into this uh, novel idea We have been doing research and clinical work on the use of vascularized bone for treatment of difficult fractures for many, many years. Vascularized bone is simply a term that's used to describe moving bone from some place in your body that's that's expendable to other places where you need it to solve a difficult fracture. This is typically done in conjunction with pairing blood vessels that supply that piece of bone two blood vessels in the region where you're transferring it. It simply means that it's very similar to bone grafting, except that the bone that we're moving is living bone the moment we connect the blood vessels. We had been working in this field for over a decade in my lab and in our hand center and have a great interest in it. There was a very fortunate um, relationship that developed between myself and Dr. Heinsberger, who is a close friend and colleague in Austria, who had also been spending a great deal of time clinically and in his lab focusing on the use of vascularized bone for difficult skeletal problems. We had discussed over many, many visits and many years of uh, collaboration the different approaches to different problems about the wrist, and Keenbox became one of them that we focused on. However, in order to rebuild the lunate, 
the trick is that we don't just need bone. We need bone and cartilage. Now, recall cartilage is this shiny white surface. When you open, say, for example, a chicken wing, you see that surface that is smooth and enables joints to move and glide smoothly. Cartilage is what is lining the outside of the lunate. And so if we were to remove fragments of a shattered lunate, we couldn't simply stick in routine bone graft. We needed to insert bone that has cartilage on it. That excludes using cadaver parts? It does. It needs to be your own tissue. And the cartilage part of the equation requires that it needs to come from a joint. So cartilage only exists in joints. Okay. So in this case, one of the procedures that we had been performing for years for harvesting, as we say, uh, vascularized bone from the human skeleton was in the distal aspect of the femur, which is the thigh bone. The blood vessels that we used and had studied and have described the anatomy of this uh, local blood supply around the knee in detail showed that there was a blood vessel that meandered up into the knee joint, into an area where the cartilage that surfaces the end of the femur and provides a joint against which the patella or kneecap uh, articulates has one of these blood vessels that courses to it. So in following this blood vessel, we concluded that it would be possible to harvest a segment of bone and cartilage from what's called the patellofemoral joint, which is to say where the kneecap meets the femur. And this would be an area which is of very low impact for the patient, has been harvested for other purposes in the past, but in this particular instance, we would be taking it with blood vessels in the same manner that we've been performing vascularized bone transfers in the past. So this idea is what spawned the potential for actually, instead of deleting crumbled lunates and removing them, to rebuilding them. That was a bit of a light bulb moment. And we then studied the shape and size and morphology, the arc of curvature, the height and width of segment that could be harvested, and found that, fortunately, it's very, very similarly shaped to the proximal end of your lunate. So that's a bit of luck. Yeah. So you're literally replacing the original anatomy or, or recreating, I should say, recreating the original anatomy that was lost. Right. So it's true. We're removing a portion of the lunate that's crumbled and fragmented. Uh, however, we're also keeping a portion of the lunate that is not crumbled. And imagine if we removed 75% of the lunate, we would keep the good 25%. And then need to replace the bad 75%. But that bad 75% has to be replaced with a piece of bone and cartilage that's shaped just like the previous healthy lunate. So our goal is to try and make a lunate that looks exactly like your opposite wrist. We're trying to replicate normal anatomy. And how are you doing that? Are you down in the operating room with a Dremel? Well, when we harvest the, we use the word harvest, when we take that bone from the knee, our goal is to use this sort of ethos of just take only what you need and nothing more. So we've become quite accustomed to harvesting exactly the dimensions that we need. Uh, And this is typically, just to put perspective on it, the segment that we're harvesting is about 15 millimeters by 12 millimeters by 14 millimeters. So uh, it's perhaps a little bit bigger than a marble, just to... (laughs) And the the segment then we do bring to the back table, we call it to the back table in the operating room, and it's close to the shape of a lunate, but we, ha- we do have to fashion it, carve it, and hone it into the exact size and shape of the piece that's missing. In the very beginning, that was a very time-consuming procedure because, as you can imagine, the first time you do something, it's the hardest. And <laughs> then we get quite capable of making it very similar in size and shape to a lunate. And we've really studied the osteology is a word we use to describe the size and shape of the various bones. We've really studied that in detail of the lunate and have become pretty good at carving this down to the perfect size and shape. So when we put it in the wrist, we have a live x-ray device that enables us to look in real time at the bone as we move it around. And once it's in the perfect position, we fix it with um, some hardware in the wrist. After the x-ray looks perfect and we say, Carpentry is good. We've restored the carpal height and, and uh, the appearance of the lunate. Then the sort of second phase of the operation starts, and that's when we take the blood vessel, which we have harvested along with the piece of bone from the knee, and drape that blood vessel into an area in the wrist where there is a artery and vein. And we use a microscope to connect those blood vessels 
Are you connecting that blood vessel to the, the original lunate that was left behind? You said that you would keep the healthy piece of the lunate, That's or is right. it just the piece that you transferred from the knee? It's, it's connected just to the piece we're transferring from the knee. So the healthy portions of the lunate are perfused, meaning they get blood supply, from the surrounding ligaments. We are bringing with this bone from the knee, imagine as it comes up, this, like I said, the size of a marble perhaps, it comes out of the knee and attached to it just like a kite with a little tail on it. The tail is the artery in the veins. So when we insert that bone into the appropriate spot and get the carpentry correct, we then drape the tail of the kite, so to speak, which are the three blood vessels, one artery and two veins, into the adjacent area where the artery and veins are. The microscope enables us to make extremely small connections, in some cases sub-millimeter in diameter, between these small vessels. It's really, really small plumbing, essentially, with super fine suture. This enables us to allow the blood supply to pulse through the blood vessel in the arm and into the blood vessels that supply the bone and the rest. So it now lives in its new home as if, as if it's always been there. How big is the incision in the wrist and how big is the incision in the knee? So the incision in the wrist and knee are about equal in length and the length is seven and a half centimeters. So it's little, that sounds way smaller than I expected. Yeah, we try, we've honed this down. We're trying to make them as small as possible so that the operation is not as much of an undertaking for the patient. So seven and a half centimeters, you think uh, an inch is about two and a half centimeters. Uh, so you figure that that's in the range of uh, three inches. And with the standard, the former way of doing key and box surgery, wasn't that a larger incision? Yes. The, many of the procedures that are described for key and box disease, where we shorten bones, where we move blood vessels from one area into the bone, those are often performed through larger incisions. Now it's been, well, you said you first went to Austria in 2010. Mm -hmm. You brought back that procedure. When was the first time that you'd performed this procedure? So we have applied this procedure for the use of Keenbox, I believe the very first time in Baltimore in 2014, I think. The earliest application of this for Keenbox disease we had performed together in Austria so Heinz and I have been working and honing this procedure for many, many years, but it was not until I felt like this was something that I could do solo in Baltimore did I actually introduce it to Baltimore. So it's been a, at least seven, eight years, maybe a decade that you've been doing it. Right. And what's the long-term impact retrospectively? How do the patients recover? So, so we've studied this in great detail, as you can imagine, because it's responsible to... Uh, study this carefully because it's a novel operation. You're trying to figure out, is this going to be an answer for the future or is this just something that we have found was useful but does not outpace or outperform other procedures? So we have studied them first retrospectively, meaning following the patients that we had performed surgery on and uh, published those results, which are readily available on the internet. Uh, those results showed that our ability to get the lunate to heal and become one solid piece of bone with restored carpal height was extremely successful. The things that the operation has done really well for patients is resolution of pain, is restoration of size and shape of the lunate, preservation of all your wrist bones, and excellent restoration of grip strength. What we're working on still is trying to restore range of motion. It's very difficult after an open wrist procedure and keen box disease to ever get a patient back to the normal arc of extension and flexion of the wrist that they enjoyed, enjoyed prior to the keen box disease or in their opposite wrist. But we're making headway in that. With what, therapy? I mean, what helps? Therapy, and we have tried to uh, change our, our approach to the lunate and our length of immobilization, meaning how long we keep patients in casts, for example. Mm so that we can get them moving a little sooner. In general, patient satisfaction with the operation has been really high because in the end of the day, if one gets rid of all of the pain, restores grip strength, and uh, enables patients to return to work and sport, even in the setting of some loss of range of motion as compared to their opposite wrist, they're generally very satisfied with it. On top of it, usually those patients were previously facing down the alternative, which was removal of bones in the wrist or partial fusions of the wrist. So it's certainly been a great introduction of great new technology for these patients, and they are uniformly happy that they, that they did it. 
We are currently studying all the patients that we do this on, following them prospectively to see how they do over the course of years because we want to give better data to patients that say, hey, I'm interested in this operation. What is the percentage chance that I'll have success or what's the percentage of my range of motion? Or, Of course, the issue also is their knee. So it's these so patients long. have no knee problems prior to the surgery and they're concerned like sure. they're about to have an a second limb operated on. And we have followed all of those patients and demonstrated return to sport, return to powerlifting and soccer and biking and all sorts of cutting sports, basketball. So, And there's been no backlash from that. There's been no negative impact long term. We have um, followed all of them with outcomes measures, which is to say questionnaires about their function. And there are some patients that we say, well, it's interesting you're doing so well with recreation or it's interesting you do so well with work, but you have uh, difficulties with this or that activity, or you notice difficulty when you're uh, going up or downstairs. And we tried to figure out which patients would predictably have more difficulty than others. And uh, the biggest risk factor we found is obesity. So in patients with a uh, higher body mass index, they would have predictably slower recovery from the knee surgery. Mm-hmm. So we always caution those patients if they're considering the surgery to say, you know, this is an independent risk factor. And we're, we're trying to be very responsible and figure out who is at higher risk and who's at low risk. But generally speaking, I would say, uh, as we've published extensively on, the knee recovers completely from this operation. So once you've basically restored a patient's wrist to almost its original anatomy with this bone from the knee, can avascular necrosis happen again to this recreated lunate? It's never happened so far, okay. so I'm going to say no. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awful? <laughs> yeah, that would be bad. So it's really, it makes sense that it would seem to be impossible that it would occur because we literally have replaced the bone. So, and we've provided its own novel blood supply. So, but we don't know what caused it in the first place. That's true. That's a good, it. that's a good counter argument. We do, we do <laughs> ponder that ourselves, but it, we have never experienced that so far. Well, that's great to know. So is there anything anyone can do, do you think, to avoid getting box? No. Yeah. There are no protect, protective medications or protective measures that one can take. And so people will often ask me that, particularly if they have a problem, they're concerned about their opposite wrist, or they have a problem, they're concerned about their relatives. There is no, nothing that we have identified, no dietary or activity recommendations that we can provide patients. And if your parent had it, you are likely or has no relevance? It's still very unlikely. There is a slight increase in risk with genetics, but the likelihood is still very, very slim that you would develop it. However, you're at higher risk than than the rest of the population. How are you spreading the knowledge to help other doctors, other hand surgeons around the unit? Is it around the United States or Mm -hmm. around the world? This is an area of great interest uh, in our subspecialty field. And we have often traveled to other institutions and to national meetings and congresses uh, around the world talking about the topic of vascularized osteochondral transfer is what we call it. This tool is applicable for Keenbox disease, but also very applicable for some other problems in the wrist that were also previously somewhat unsolved. So it's gaining a great deal of interest globally, and many surgeons are interested in learning this technique. We do a lot of lecturing on it. We have written many, many chapters in various textbooks uh, and surgical guides for surgeons uh, on this topic. And we also have a very well-established and highly reputable training program here at the Curtis National Land Center. So our trainees uh, will come here and get a very good experience over the course of their training in the use of bone and cartilage transfer and will often be the best prepared of anyone in the country to bring this to their home institutions. So I think over time, this is something that will be more widely offered. But like many operations in uh, their relative infancy, that that spread is going, it's going to be slow. So it's reported that for every 100,000 people in the U.S., seven people will get a diagnosis of Kienbox disease. How many times do you think that you do the surgery, I don't know, in a month? Yeah, we're doing three to four of these procedures a month. And so it appears here in Baltimore that it's raining Kienbox disease, but it's because there are so many patients coming from out of state Uh, So our view of the frequency of this problem is skewed. The incidence that is published in the literature and may be available on the internet is really difficult 
to interpret. And part of that reason is there are many patients that are likely suffering from keen box disease that have not identified that as a problem. The diagnosis is hard to make. It's often delayed. And so um, determining the true incidence in the population is difficult. However, it is considered rare. And in truth, it certainly is much rarer than other common problems such as carpal tunnel syndrome or arthritis. But rare or not, when it occurs to your wrist and you're in your 20s, it's it's a big deal. It's a devastating, and, it's a devastating issue. Yeah. So there's four stages of key in box. We, we didn't really get into that, but in an earlier stage, which you said most people don't realize they have it, if they do get a diagnosis in an early stage, is it, can you avert the damage? Can you yes. prevent it? Yes. And that we love finding patients earlier in their stages. And, and you're right. There are a couple of classification systems for staging keen box disease. And in the earlier stages, the lunate is generally not collapsed yet or fractured. So in those patients, they will undergo uh, leveling procedures typically. This is where one of the adjacent bones is shortened in order to take pressure off the lunate to see if it can relieve the problem uh, of the lunate. And that has a good success track, a good track record of success. So I will often perform those if I see patients that come to me or telemedically consult with us and say, this is what my x-rays and my CT scan and my clinical situation looks like, and we will suggest they undergo that operation. That is a widely performed operation. Uh, and so I will And they often, don't come back later? They don't come back later after that? It can. Does it just... Per- it can. It's okay. Not, it's not uniformly uh, successful over the course of their life. Some patients will experience success temporarily with that operation, which is uh, called a radial shortening osteotomy, and then subsequently have problems later. So it's a difficult thing to assess with certainty whether or not you've achieved what you would call cure. Right. Uh, and and those just postpone the it inevitable. May, it may postpone it, or you may be cured. And so uh, we define success in Keenbox disease in uh, two ways. One is that you report that your pain is relieved. And the second is that the x-ray does not progress, meaning the lunate never returns to looking completely normal. But if it no longer progresses, it doesn't continue to collapse. It doesn't fracture if it hasn't fractured yet. It doesn't become denser if uh, you're following the color of the lunion on the, on the x-ray. So th- that's how we define it. So if those patients have success with a radial shortening osteotomy, that may be all they ever need. But in some cases, they may have temporary success and later return with problems. Okay, real quick, before we wrap it up, I want to make sure people who are thinking about the surgery understand what the recovery is like. So they come out of surgery, what kind of pain meds do they get? How long should they expect to feel pain? And is there therapy to follow up? Yeah. So the operation is typically done as an inpatient procedure. You stay in the hospital overnight, go home the next morning. We would typically do these in the afternoon and then the patients uh, leave the hospital uh, typically around 10 or 11 in the morning the next day. The post-surgical treatment is 12 weeks of immobilization. So they're held still in a cast or splint for 12 weeks. At that 12-week mark, we then obtain the final x-ray and CT scan. The CT scan also known as a CAT scan, is what enables us to assess the bony healing. If that demonstrates that they've successfully healed, and the chances are that they likely will, because this does have a high success rate, then they are told that they no longer need any immobilization, and they start therapy working on trying to regain range of motion of the wrist and can return to any activity they wish, including sports and, and lifting. The, what about the knee? Is that wrapped up, and is it weight-bearing? Can they put weight on their knee? They can weight bear right away. So after the knee surgery, they typically get just a small adhesive sticker, so to speak, over the incision, but you're allowed to weight bear and walk on it right away. That's amazing. It's like a Band-Aid. Yeah, the the knee certainly hurts. You know, it's not as if you don't you don't know that you had surgery. Right. Uh, and I typically tell patients that in the first two weeks after surgery, if they need pain medicine, they're typically taking it for their knee because they're weight bearing on their knee. Right. Whereas the arm's in a cast, and that's not typically that painful. So uh, after the two-week period, though, most patients are no longer on pain medicine or perhaps using Tylenol or Motrin. What's the most important thing people should understand about key and box disease and the treatment? What's the takeaway? I think the most important message is that this is a diagnosis that patients, when they receive it, seems very scary. It's named after an Austrian radiologist from the early 1900s 
no one in your living room or in your social group has ever mentioned Keenbox disease. Whereas carpal tunnel syndrome, you certainly heard of that. So no one wants to be told by their doctor that they have a rare disease. That being said, whereas many aspects of Keenbox were previously untreatable, now they are treatable. And it's something that has a great track record. We can fix it. We can get you out of that trouble and return you to your previous activities. So for these young patients where this can sometimes hit them as like a ton of bricks, there are answers and we have those answers and, and we'd be happy to share those with them. And Dr. Higgins, I know that you're going to be really humble about this, but um, the, the patients who I've spoken to through the years have been extremely happy with the result and so glad that they chose that option. I, I don't mind saying that here. I do think it's very gratifying. You know, this is a very satisfying area to work in because the patients are in a somewhat difficult spot and they're so relieved to find out that there's some cutting edge novel procedure that can be offered them, uh, particularly with a great track record. So I love doing it. It's uh, it makes job, my job very satisfying. Right. And uh, the relationships with the patients are, have, have been uh, some of the most rewarding for me. Good job. We've been talking with Dr. James Higgins, Chief of the Curtis National Hand Center at MedStar Union Memorial Hospital in Baltimore. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today on MedStar Health Dot Talk. For more information about the Curtis National Hand Center, click on the name under locations at medstarhealth.org or for an appointment with Dr. Higgins, call 410-554-6560.